Um, my name is Michael Walls. I'm DPU director, um, and I'm really excited to be here. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, it's basically because the impetus for this series has really come more than anyone else from my colleague, Dr. Catalina Ortiz. Um, she's kept the idea of a series on post pandemic planning on the agenda for many more months than we thought we'd need. But I remember when we started those conversations midway through one or other of those early lockdowns, we had a dilemma. Um, the pandemic both directly affected so much of development planning that it was obvious we needed to do something, we needed to talk about it. But it also threw into sharper relief many of the complexities of those processes, in a lot of cases in areas apparently unrelated to the pandemic itself. Somehow the pandemic made us all rethink the challenges posed by, for example, climate change, of inequality within and between countries and cities, or of transport and mobility, and of housing and access to basic rights and so on. Yet much of the rhetoric was either profoundly opportunistic and not in a good way. I mean, the focus was on either just getting through, regardless of what the outcome was, or worse still on taking an unprincipled approach to profiting from the opportunities thrown up by massive social disruption. Or on the other hand, they were blandly aspirational, offering few clues on how we might get to somewhere that offers a, a qualitative improvement on what was there before. You know, for example, building back better is a wonderful example. It offers a real challenge to seek improvement, but it's also such an unfocused slogan that our own UK government can blithely adopt it without concerning themselves for the, with the consequences of many of their own actions. And that was the dilemma. So we talked a lot about how we could at DPU contribute to a conversation that took the challenges seriously in all their complexity and their multivariant shape that accorded appropriate priority to the urgent social and environmental issues we must confront and that did so with genuine concern for the principles of social and environmental justice, but also offered meaningful insights on possible courses of action, starting points, processes, and on a range of different topics, often requiring difficult trade-offs and real debate and discussion about how we go about making key decisions. In a lot of ways, I think that's exactly what academia should be here for, to tackle these really difficult issues thoughtfully and as practically as possible. And that's why I'm so excited to be able to kick this discussion off now, because it really does mark the um, starting point of, and the end of the discussion on what kinds of conversations we need to have. So that's why I'm so excited to, to see this, this series uh, underway. We start off, of course, with a hugely topical conversation on multi-level governance, but I'll let Catalina introduce that in a moment. For my part now, I just want to say welcome to everybody. I take huge pleasure um, in having you all here, and I'm really looking forward to the topic of not just this presentation, but also those to follow in the series. I really believe it's going to be an interesting an invaluable series of events that I hope helps frame and consolidate ideas on where we go from here and how we get to somewhere worth getting to. So thank you for being here. I want to hand over now to Catalina to introduce this first, um, this first in the series on post-pandemic planning in the South. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Michael. So my name is Catalina Ortiz and I will be chairing this session today. So today, uh, as Michael said, uh, the topic that brings us together is to discuss particularly planning futures and what is the role of multilevel governance in urban equality endeavors. So as we have experienced as a planetary scale disruption, COVID pandemic has amplified existing inequality patterns and became a ma major governance challenge requiring, requiring intersectoral coordination in the midst of high fragmentation and contestation. In this context, development planning is pivotal to navigate collectively uncertainty and reshape multi-actor relationships to strive for social environmental justice. And that is what DPU keeps wondering and deepening about. 
In this event, we will be discussing on the tensions the pandemic has brought to the localization of global agendas, multi-actor and multi-scale alliances and partnerships, grassroots mobilization, um, urban conflict and security regimes, and how the digital divides and the use of technology has been used for intersectoral coordination. So we're very happy and privileged to be joined by Professor Karen Levy, uh, who is a seminal figure in DPU and currently is leading um, a, re a big research project uh, called Knowledge in Action for Urban Equality. So some of her insights are gonna be drawing uh, from her experience leading this project. And we also have Dr. Jaydeep Gupte. He's a fellow in the Institute of Development Studies and a leader of the cities cluster there. And currently is also part of the cities and sustainable infrastructure portfolio in the Global uh, Challenges Research Fund. So we are very happy to have him. And we, when we were organizing this, we thought we need you know, people that really understand the agenda, uh, the development planning takes and how through the lenses of the different topics that we're gonna be addressing, discuss then what is the fate and how we need to reshape development uh, planning as we know it. So we are gonna be focusing on three uh, questions. Um, one is how the field of development planning can further urban equality and, and drawing from the insights and the projects that our panelists uh, are involved, what are the key lessons uh, of working with multi-actor and multi-scale partnerships to, urban, to further urban equality? And finally, how to reframe urban data and co-production of knowledge to go beyond the response and recovery debate and planning. So without further ado then, uh, let me introduce Professor Karen Levy who will be uh, speaking first, and then we're gonna have Jaydeep. We're gonna have a time to uh, discuss a little bit, and, but please uh, to the audience start uh, putting in the Q&A box any comment or question, and we will be collecting it and have a time for Q&A towards the end. Thank you. Welcome, Karen. Thank you, Catalina. Um, I'd like to start this discussion on planning futures um, by acknowledging our friend and colleague, Vanessa Watson, who sadly passed away a, a few weeks ago. She leaves a significant legacy in the field of planning and development, um, and, and particularly in the development of Southern theory and planning. And of course, um, that legacy has critical implications for discussions such as this one this afternoon. So we remember her. Um, the main question of this dialogue about reshaping planning in pandemic and post-pandemic times led me to consider not necessarily new ideas, but ideas that have been around for a bit of time, but seem to me even more urgent than ever. And, and to some extent, I think we need to explore why it is that they haven't actually yet been properly taken on and properly implemented and, and fully understood. I think that's an important part of, of, of I think, of the exploration we, we also need to do. I want to point to just four of these ideas. And I also will draw, as Catalina said, on the NO program uh, to demonstrate um, their implications in, in selected examples of multi-level governance um, uh, for urban equality. So I'm going to share my slide, my slides now. Um, and the first of those four ideas uh, is exactly where Catalina started on the notion of inequality. And we've heard a lot these days uh, that the pandemic fed off inequality, that it fed into inequalities. Um, but as far as I can honestly say, and I wonder if, if many of you don't agree with me on this, I don't see it carried over into action in policymaking and planning yet. Uh, and it's not as if we haven't been talking about inequality for some time. However, I think that the pandemic experience highlighted something very particular about these inequalities, things that many of us knew already, but came to the fore, which is the intersectional character of these inequalities. And I think that that's something we need to take away with us uh, in, in, into the, into the, the near future. Um, it 
the pandemic highlighted questions of class, questions of gender, questions of age. In other words, when we look at the impact of the pandemic, it was unequal in, 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 in depending on people's social identity and these social relations. And it highlighted for us something that we, we know already, but that we haven't properly faced is this intersectional character of inequality. And I've got here on these three, uh, these four uh, red balls, the principles of inequality that we work with in the NO program. The question of recognition of those social relations. And so in a sense that that's a very critical dimension in intersectionality, a critical dimension of that, but how that then plays out on the redistribution of material goods and services that make up a decent life for people, how that plays up on questions of solidarity and care and the civic character of cities and how that plays out on the participation in decision making about how planning, uh, what planning does um, in, in cities. And so what, I, what I'm saying here is that I think that uh, uh, the, the first sort of critical thing is to recognize in planning futures is to practice planning with an intersectional lens uh, around this inequality. Um, and we have a long history already of different elements of this, but that history has also shown us that often when we look at questions of inequality through an intersectional lens, we often lose the relational character of inequalities. In other words, we slip from looking at rich and poor to looking at poor. We slip from looking at gender to looking at women. We slip from looking at able-bodied to disability. We slip from looking at age to looking at the young. And so we often lose that relational character. And we also then very often lose the intersectional character of what after all is the lived experience of all of us. We all live with the intersectional character of inequality in some way or another, but we don't seem to be able to work with that in planning. So that's the first uh, uh, issue I think we need to think about. The second issue, again, not a new one, is the recognition of informality. And what did the, what did the pandemic highlight for us? Well, to quote my, my friend here, Jadeep Gupta and Diana Mitlin, at the very beginning of the pandemic, informality seemed to be being blamed for the spread of the pandemic. And it was very, very important that that be demystified. Um, but it's not the first time that informality is being blamed for the problems of the city. And I think that this is a very something that we have, just haven't got quite right. Uh, we need to shift that debate. And this is something that many people have said, including our, my colleague Vanessa Watson in her, in her very classic 2009 commentary on this, the planned city sweeps away, sweeps the poor away. Uh, so we need to shift this debate from criminalizing large proportions of the urban population to acknowledging their contribution to the city and recognizing their right to the city. It seems to me, why, why is it that people are living without basic services and decent housing in this day and age particularly in the light of the pandemic when WHO and governments and scientists recognized that access to these basic needs were fundamental to survival through the pandemic. It was such a fundamental contradiction and such an obvious issue in the face of all of us uh, that, it, that we have to simply ask that question, why are we still living like that? So the question for me is really the second issue is reframe, reframing informality and in planning, regulation and implementation. We've got to move beyond the talk and start walking the walk on this properly in cities. And remembering that we're not dealing with minorities here. We're dealing with a large proportions of urban populations. Uh, so this is a really very, very important uh, uh, issue to, to pick up. The third issue is a recognition of planning's contribution 
um, to the creation and distribution of what I've called the sur surplus value in the city. The pandemic didn't talk directly to this, but it did seem to me to show how local governments were completely bypassed in top-down national responses to the pandemic. Um, and these responses, nevertheless, were to, to redistribute, uh, to support vulnerable people in the pandemic. Many of us thought perhaps it wasn't enough, and in some governments didn't do anything, but there were attempts by governments in various countries to provide some kind of financial support or some set of institutional uh, uh, networks or, uh, to, to, to catch vulnerable people in society. And it seems to me that what we must uh, reimagine is the capacity of governments to use their planning and fiscal powers to create and distribute value and public funds to support vulnerable groups. Um, and land development, after all, land development and management is a very powerful wealth creating tool in the city. And why aren't policymakers and planners actually using that? Uh, to, to, to reach the goals and to build the pathways to spatial and socio-environmental justice. Um, in some cities, we find people starting to think about things like value recycling, value capture, value realization, value creation. And I think this, for me, is a crucial dimension, planning practice that cap captures and redistributes surplus value, I think has more of a chance of addressing these four principles of urban equality. The, the final, the fourth point, the final, my final point, um, deals with uh, 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 the, really what I think many of us have talked about for a long time, uh, the questions of reclaiming uh, or building, pl doing planning in partnerships with equivalents. What the, what the, the pandemic highlighted was the solidarity of communities carrying uh, with carried neighborhoods and cities through the pandemic when many governments were either absent or pursuing top down policies to address the health crisis. And here I, I if, if anybody wants to read about some of these amazing things that happened, um, the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights produced a newsletter in April 2020 really uh, documenting some of the extraordinary things that communities were doing. We need to recognize that partners are essential in the making of cities. City, community partners are essential in the making of cities. And that partnerships with equivalents, which also foster solidarity and parity political participation of urban communities in policy making and planning, actually strengthen inclusive and effective governance. So what we're talking about here as a fourth dimension is to practice planning in partnerships with equivalents. So these are, I know there are big, big ideas in many ways, but these are the four issues that I think are so crucial. And what I want to do is just to share with you very, very briefly, and I'm happy to expand on this in the, in the session, in the discussion, some examples of multi-scalar governance from the NO program, which try to talk to some of those things. Before I do that, I think it's important just briefly to say what we understand by partnerships with equivalents. We talk about it as, as embracing mutual respect, reciprocal and transparent accountability, the co-production of knowledge, which is central to a research program like NO, and the capacity to learn together, co-learning. With those in mind, the NO program uh, has uh, in the context of Freetown, been working with mechanisms to incorporate uh, um, uh, informal settlements into the governance structures of that city and to create community, what we call community learning platforms uh, that link from the bottom to the citywide transform Freetown agenda and beyond into the national planning frameworks. This is driven by our partners SLURC and their partners on the ground. Um, and you can have a look at this in 
one of the principles of engagement for the city learning platform in our practitioner brief on our website, the no website. What we see here is a drawing showing that multi-level governance, which actually in the end addresses all of these issues that I've talked about. It tries to capture that inter inter um, intersectional lens by looking in this case at gender and class, the intersection of gender and class in the way that these platforms are constructed. It, it definitely is absolutely centrally located in the recognition of informality since it is there in order to represent informal settlements through first local community uh, learning platforms and then linking into a citywide learning platform which contains a range of actors from inside and outside government. Um, and so it's attempting in this process then to, to strengthen urban governance and to eventually capture and redistribute um, the uh, surplus in the city through land management. Another example is our partners in Dar es Salaam, uh, CCI and their local partners working with simplified sewerage in informal settlements. And what we see in this is a key engagement through the uh, with communities and with the a municipality with the, um, the, the 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 nation the national utility uh, going through a process of co-producing knowledge about sewerage in the city and demonstrating the use of different technologies and then critically agreeing the cost and the tariffs of that of that new kind of way of approaching a, 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 a sewerage in cities uh, so that it's affordable to the poor. And in that sense, it also collectively addresses all the principles that I've, that I've talked about. A final example I want to give is the example of community kitchens in Lima that my colleagues Puk and their partners on the ground are involved in. This is something that came directly out of the pandemic because it came out of the food shortages in the city and organized communities were responding to the need, that need. But it was also building on a history of community kitchens in Lima, a long history of community kitchens. And the engagement was very much drawing on communities uh, with a recognition of the gender division of labor. It was drawing on NGOs, municipality and the university. And some of the outcomes were co-produced knowledge and design of community kitchens, improved infrastructure and design, and actually the institutionalization of this in planning regulation. And in that sense, this was also, in a sense, addressing these planning futures together, not separately, but together. Um, and when, when I think about these, these cases, these three cases, and I could have given many, many more, I'm thinking also about how do these city level cases relate to global glo goals like the SDGs, which are so, uh, uh, so much discussed in our time. And I think applying an equality lens to the SDGs does really help us navigate between the universal and the specific. In other words, what happens when you localize as against what happens when you universalize in, in something like a global uh, a, 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 um, sustainable development goal. But it also starts to show us how we might navigate the synergies and tensions across goals, because all of those examples I've given uh, actually are hitting, hitting more than one of these goals in some way or another. And again, please do have a look at this uh, um, international engagement brief on our website if you want to have a look more at that issue. Finally, my final slide is to look at uh, uh, what I think is a really interesting initiative within the NO program, which is talking with and working with UCLG, the United Cities and Local Governments Network, um, on the next gold report which will focus on pathways to urban and territorial equality, addressing inequalities through local transformation strategies. And so in a sense, it encapsulates everything that I've talked about. And uh, this looks like a super complex picture. And in a sense it is, because what we've tried to do, our vision for this 
development of this gold report is not a top-down expert-led process, but really engaging with UCLG network and its membership, engaging with civil society networks, engaging with our no partners and with other academics in order to share and develop a common agenda uh, uh, in order to, to, to really put some of the issues I've discussed high up on the future uh, dis the discussion about uh, pandemic and post-pandemic development. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Karen. It's a very a wonderful uh, depiction of the complexities and the many layers and key points uh, of discussion. So without further ado, I, I invite Jaideep to, to join us and share your presentation. Thanks, Karen. That was a, a real tour de force, which is going to be hard to follow. Um, let me share my screen. OK. Here we go. So um, some some major um, caveats, and if, if it stops uh, sharing again, Catalina, just let me know. But um, I'm switching between screens. Okay. So some caveats um, in my comments. Uh, I wanted to put some air quotes around uh, planning. I wanted to put some air quotes around post COVID, and I wanted to put some air quotes around urban. Um, and I know that doesn't um, leave much else, but I did want to caution you that given the fluidity of what these terms meant uh, locally and non-locally that, you know, take my thoughts uh, with, a, with a pinch of, pinch of salt. Um, that said, um, and those caveats in place, uh, let me take you back to uh, late March 2020, uh, when uh, hundreds upon thousands of daily wage migrants, um, uh, migrant laborers, uh, gathered at the Anand Vihar bus terminus uh, and the immediately surrounding areas to be evacuated out of India's capital, uh, New Delhi. You know, it had been uh, about four days since India's prime minister announced uh, a total ban on coming out of homes. Uh, every state, every union territory, every district, village, town, lane, neighborhood in the country, he said, will be locked down. Uh, with only four hours notice, uh, this was uh, one of the most severe public health measures taken anywhere uh, against COVID-19. Uh, but of course, as the construction sites, as businesses, uh, markets, even local and national transport systems up and down the country shut down, migrant laborers were left stranded in urban centers. And it only took a few days for their savings, which you know, had already been depleted by disruptions caused by the Delhi riots a month earlier, uh, and of course, the government's demonetization policy is prior to that uh, to evaporate. So as, as hunger and fear set in, uh, rumors of state provided bus transportation back to their rural homes in neighboring states had sparked the sizable gathering. Um, so the, the, the complex tensions between you know, this scale of human suffering as a result of necessary public health measures uh, and thinking of post-COVID urban futures as we are today, um, brings me to make three points, and they uh, relate a great deal to what uh, Karen has, uh, has already taken us through. Um, the first is that, um, in my view, governing the post-pandemic urban future, or can we just call it urban future from here on, right, uh, will involve a careful balancing between a relativist approach uh, with the need to uphold certain universalist knowledge. And, and, and what do I mean by this? Um, so public reasoning needs to happen, in my view, locally and non-locally and across various localities, if you will. So a, a sense of multi-scalarity uh, across cities, within cities, perhaps, perhaps even across urban fragments, right, in Colin McFarnell's uh, recent words. Um, but also, in my view, individual and community well-being become important scales to assess inequalities and vulnerabilities as relational and intersectional uh, uh, concepts, as, as Karen has already spoken to us about, alongside roadmaps for the future, for sort of future interventions and, and more universalist uh, development goals. And of course, transdisciplinary mutual learning, um, in my view, is going to be required in the ways that Karen suggests to build these ideological, political, even civic consensus around aspirations, around values, uh, around what worth is to arrive at some kind of mutually agreed anchoring points. And 
Uh, and to me, emphasis will no longer be on the on, on what the right urban science is, but convincing people of the right urban science and of their rights uh, that arise from that science. Um, the second point I wanted to make uh, was around paying quite close attention to governing uh, and rights in the post-pandemic digital city, right? And, and so here, the immense infrastructural in inequalities, I suppose, embodied in brick and mortar infrastructures, uh, which are deeply gendered. Uh, hey, sorry to interrupt you again, but I think your slides are not going through. We are still in the first one that says me your caveats. Oh, goodness. Okay, uh, so you've, you've missed, a, missed a, a, a nice little range of my slides. I don't know what's going I on. I talk there for some reason. Now we can see it. Maybe you need to, to just keep that view and okay. move it through. Okay, uh, you missed a little, uh, a little video I showed at the start of, of the migrants gathering. Um, anyhow, um, can, you still, can you still see my slides? Now we see it, yes. Okay. Um, so here we are in the um, in the in the post-pandemic digital city, where I was saying the um, the inequalities in brick and mortar are indeed deeply gendered, um, and we know that these inequalities are being replicated in digital infrastructures and digital spaces, right? Uh, but there are significant, in my view, um, epistemic and I suppose ontological shifts that are also occurring in. Uh, bottom-up and action-oriented approaches um, with increasing distance between the researcher and the subject, uh, between the subaltern and the state, um, and I suppose as the popularity of governing from a distance increases. Uh, and we can see deep and deepening inequalities, not just in access to digital infrastructure, but also in terms of, of capabilities. There, uh, there are also temporal issues here about how uh, fast or, or or how often people uh, connect, um, which um, connect to the digital uh, infrastructures, which varies a great deal by gender, by socioeconomic status, and a range of intersectional issues. Of course, I'm referring to Ayana Datta's work here. Um, and, and at the city scale, I suppose we must take note, and indeed I, I take a great deal of interest in um, in, in the increasing but at times unseen reliance on computational decision, decision support and the use of artificial intelligence that can really amplify the mistakes and these inequalities uh, at pace. Um, so governing in the post-pandemic digital city to me will also involve navigating new challenges and barriers of advocating for citizens' rights in digital spaces, right? So here I'm drawing on uh, some fascinating work by my colleagues at IDS and the African Digital Rights Network um, to take note of digital openings uh, alongside digital closings. Um, and, and, and I suppose my rather pessimistic view here is that COVID-19 has done more to close digital space than it has to open them. Um, you know, we've reaffirmed that technologies are not apolitical and, and post-pandemic urban futures will necessarily need to, uh, to embody uh, a certain type of politique, uh, the, the types that um, uh, Karen was referring to. And, and there is a real danger here of hardwiring um, the emergency excesses and what were meant to be really temporary measures to control public space and digital space. So we need to think about how we counter those uh, excesses. But also, uh, and this is quite important to, to take note of, is that we have seen right through the pandemic that on-ground in-person advocacy has not stopped. And Karen pointed out a number of uh, examples as well. You know, we repeatedly saw across many cities that the mediating role of community leaders continued. Uh, and in some cases, uh, indeed, intensified through lockdowns. Um, so there was, you know, there are tangible opportunities here to strengthen uh, the influence of subaltern voices uh, and agency as, um, as digital and ICT-based uh, advocacy becomes more significant. And I can, uh, uh, since I've lost some time, but I was going to talk through examples from Bhopal, uh, from Mumbai, from Nairobi, Lima, and elsewhere. Um, to me, uh, the post-pandemic um, digital city will 
also involve enabling uh, blended or hybrid or indeed uh, Jugard uh, data ecosystems where formal and informal um, state and citizen led digital and analog indeed local and non-local data infrastructures are synergized uh, and, and in a way that they become the mainstay of, of urban governance, right? So this, uh, and, and I'm saying this in sharp contrast uh, to the push to formalize smart infrastructures at the city uh, or national scales. Um, and here, uh, you know, you see, um, uh, you, I'll have to move this aside because I was, I was going to, <laughs> there you go. Um, I was going to actually show this as an animation, but um, you see the, the mapping of the, um, the, the track and trace system uh, in the city of Kochi that, uh, that we mapped um, uh, working in conjunction with the smart city officials. Then what we found that local interpretations of technologies or Jugard innovation where uh, information sharing and decision-making uh, seemed totally haphazard, uh, but in fact involved a, a very carefully choreographed, uh, even if totally informal coordination uh, ecosystem involving official integrated command and control right alongside informal channels like WhatsApp, like SMS. Um, and okay, now let me, this is real analog way of sh showing these slides, but here I had um, a, a, a sort of uh, a, a timeline because this type of hybridity uh, cannot happen overnight, right? And, and um, Karen, you pointed this out as well, uh, because necessarily this involves long uh, socio-political, cultural, and indeed in, uh, some, some sort of institutional transformation um, where um, the specific technologies or information systems are almost a byproduct of these transformations. So this is a timeline of decentralization of healthcare in Kerala, which empower, empowered ASHA health workers and a host of policy and institutional changes that led to a hybrid data ecosystem being operationalized during the COVID emergency where health workers knew each other's WhatsApp numbers. But, but more importantly, this involved a, a sharing of responsibilities at, at sort of multiple scales. And, and you, I fear you won't be able to see this at all unless it was animated. But you know, we picked out some immense opportunities here that. Um, digital or online learning can uh, and, and sharing can strengthen capacities across these multiple roles, multiple responsibilities uh, between departments, between authorities, across cities uh, and, and so forth. And I'll, I'll come back to this during Q&A, but just the, the final few points. So my, my, my third and final, but certainly not the least point um, is that our urban futures must mitigate the violence of the pandemic uh, and invest in safeguarding. And I note here this term violence of the pandemic um, at the risk of over jargonizing this, but uh, this is violence that I recognize as in some direct or indeed indirect way has been caused or reshaped by the pandemic. But I recognize that its occurrence uh, or indeed recurrence is not exactly aligned spatially or temporally uh, to the pandemic, right? I, I very much expect trajectories of such violence to be long lasting, uh, particularly for subaltern groups uh, and amplified beyond the pandemic uh, by unequal infrastructure, labor, caste relationships in the city. Um, but we must recognize also that subaltern experiences of the, uh, of the pandemic have thus far, uh, at least in my view, not been exceptional, but the experiences really fit within their everyday negotiations and, and other power relations within the city that predate uh, the pandemic. Um, so this, uh, this necessarily uh, implies that we must operationalize the principle of do no harm in urban practice. And here, um, and, and I'll end shortly, Katrina, I, I refer specifically to brutal policing regimes. Uh, that need to be set outside urban norms and practices. And we have to do that very, very consciously here because uh, the pandemic was a momentary view of longer standing violent impositions upon subaltern rights. Uh, you know, the, the, so the evictions, the criminalization of informality, marginalization, uh, as well as complex empowered and new struggles uh, for rights in the city. Uh, and, and I feel we can't simply just turn the page to a new normal, our, our imagination, for the post-pandemic city must create space 
uh, to address the violence that has been sustained uh, and experienced, but also for reconciliation, for resolution, uh, with subaltern interests really leading uh, policy choices there. Um, and, and finally, uh, the point that our urban futures must also operationalize the principle of do no harm in urban research. And, and uh, Karen, you mentioned this as well, but I think it's important to, to say it twice. Uh, we do need to be careful in considering practice, process, and positionality uh, in marginalized spaces. And, and here I'm drawing attention to the work of uh, that we've been doing in the Arise Hub on safeguarding uh, that involves uh, sharing institutional guidelines and practices, facilitating the particip participatory processes to agree, working definitions of safeguarding, uh, and some you know joint understandings uh, of of vulnerabilities. Um, why don't why don't I, I stop there? Sorry, the sharing of my slides was was a mess. I'm not quite sure what exactly uh, what exactly happened. Um, but I look forward to some comments uh, and and sharing my views further uh, on any questions that the audience has. Uh, thanks a lot, JD. No, I think it came across very clear your message and your three points, regardless of technical glitches. You are our technical expert. Right? <laughs> Digital technology is always <laughs> tricky. So now we have some few more minutes for Q and A. Uh, so I would invite the the the, pan the attendees to share it and write down their questions. But while we get some of the questions in the Q and A box. Perhaps we can just kick off maybe a response to each other. I think they were very complementary presentations. I think for us is is very clear um, the role that data by data ecosystems uh, play in this process, violence, co-learning and intersectional lens. Um, but I was wondering, I mean, part of the key question of this series, is to help us think as this is a cross cluster research cluster initiative. We are using also this space to, to think through what would need to be strengthened or change uh, in terms of how we design our curricula, how we shape our research agendas. So in your view, what could be kind of the key elements that we need to strengthen more when we're talking about uh, reshaping development planning? What could be kind of these uh, elements in the research agenda that need more attention and perhaps we're not paying enough attention? I think you've been clearly depicting the complexity, the, the temporality, the multiscalarity of these um, challenges, but that has been already present. So I wonder what do you think should be in our research agenda that we haven't been paying enough attention or how our curricula needs to also be strengthened in terms of uh, bringing up some of the discussions that perhaps were there but haven't been uh, enough stressed. So I don't know if you have any comments on that or any reactions to each other's uh, presentations. Maybe Karen? Well, I, I think that certainly to start with the first point that I made about intersectionality, I think really you know we need to to incorporate that and really work with it a bit more in a bit more sophisticated way in our in our uh, planning education uh, curricula um it shouldn't be a hit and miss affair it shouldn't be just because you have a certain lecturer you get you know some element of that kind of intersectionality view on 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 what equality means in the city um we should and, and it's important because it highlights people in the city and who they are and, and explains why they have the experiences they do, why they suffer the lack of access, the questions of, of lack of control, why they suffer indeed the violence that uh, Jadeep talked about. And so I feel this is, this is really, really very, very important dimension for me. I think, the same is true for for the way we think about informality, and I'm not being naive about the the, the challenges that recognizing informality uh, leads us to. Uh, but we need to be able to incorporate credible ways forward in our in our planning uh, education agendas, and and this means for a start that we have to have to recognize and do a proper critique of the political economy of planning education, 
uh, because you know there is a political economy of planning education and some ideas do have more power than others and some ideas have traveled in different ways across the globe and we are using concepts and ideas in places where they really don't have the same meaning and where they don't they're not useful and they're not helpful and you know we can say that in a particularly focused on the the colonial history of planning and what it left many parts of africa and and asia with um, and why it is that we face so many planning challenges today so I, I, I mean, the final thing is, I mean, I can go on and pick up lots of other issues, but I think the notion of expertise itself needs to be put in a different frame, because this notion of planning expertise and the creation of the profession of planning has created hierarchies in knowledge production processes, and some of those hierarchies have both been challenged but also reinforced by the digitized city that, that Jadeep talks to us about. It has the potential to do both. Um, and I think that would be super important to, to, to explore a bit more um, in, in the way we teach and what we teach. Thanks a lot, Karen. Jadeep? Uh, not much more to, to add to that. Um, in, 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 in terms of um, what Karen um, just mentioned. I mean, I, I would say that, um, you know, Karen, you, you, you mentioned one uh, point in your presentation around um, informal uh, processes and informal spaces and informal informality <coughs> is not the minority. It is uh, a very significant uh, portion of the urban experience. Um, but in terms of how we teach it, how we learn from it, uh, I think um, there we make um, certain fundamental er errors in our curricula uh, in, in either exceptionalizing it um, because we must uh, to introduce it to, to our students uh, in ways that come across as methodologically precise, uh, in ways that are in you know, bite-sized chunks that can be tested um, and we, you know you can mark a curricula. So there, there's all kinds of logistic reasons why we exceptionalize the experience of informality in our curricula. But on top of that, what COVID-19 um, has done is that networks of solidarity uh, uh, that have spoken and advocated for subaltern rights and subaltern spaces have changed. How people connect and who speaks for whom uh, has changed, perhaps not as significantly as I initially uh, sort of took the view at the start of uh, the processes of lockdown, but, but there has been um, solidarities that have changed where, um, you know, uh, uh, one's own experience of the pandemic seems to outweigh uh, what others perhaps more marginal experiences uh, are in the city. And so this rebalancing of what subaltern experiences are in the city are, I find more difficult and more complex to get, a, get across in the classroom. Because of course, all of the students and myself, we have experienced a particular type uh, of a crisis as well. Um, so it's teaching about long-term crises in the, the, the mold of a short-term immediate crisis. So there's some difficulties there. Um, and, I, and I'm not sure, um, transdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity, whichever vision you have of cutting across silos uh, is enough uh, to address those, uh, those tensions. I think we do need to think of, of new ways to arrive at some anchoring points that help us navigate uh, these new networks of solidarity. Yeah, thanks a lot. Now we have a couple of questions from the audience and but I think I just wanted to highlight um, the point of what is how we teach and research the governable and the ungovernable. And I think Jaitib has a very interesting work uh, precisely in how to navigate particularly context where, you know, even though the, the current debate about multi-level governance is a lot of people say the state is back, but what a state is that? And where the state is not there, <laughs> who governs the territory that is not the state and how we you know, deal with it. And I think this is like still a very important challenge that I'm not very sure we are <laughs> very uh, good at uh, dealing with it. 
So I'm going to read the three questions, perhaps, because we are, you know, having very <laughs> few minutes left. And perhaps I read them all the, the question and maybe you can have a final uh, concluding remarks trying to address these comments. So the first one um, comes from Vanessa Galeano. She says, thanks for the wonderful presentations. On Karen's third point, the recognition of local government's capacities to create and redistribute surplus value. I wonder if you could expand on this and share your visions on how to get this message across. Do we rather prove that? Or what are your hopes and expectations on this transition? Uh, from Miguel Incapié. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the panelists for such an interesting presentation. Link to Catalina's question. Could Karen expand a bit more on the methodologies and methods employed in the multi-case project of NO and what could be improved, implemented to identify the intersectionality and, relational, and relationality in multi-level governance? And from Fui Amevor, thank you for your presentations. Can you please expand in the no harm in research and practice that JD presented? So maybe a few concluding uh, thoughts about it. Um, I don't know if Karen could I, I, I go back to my um, my statement that you know planning of course can be totally marginal in a city and it often is um, actually planners often are way too ambitious about what they can achieve in a city but if you take seriously the development management of land you're talking about an asset of wealth and and if if planning actually is has the capacity to increase um, and to create surplus wealth in the city by virtue of questions of location, spatial distribution, uh, improvement of services, improvement of facilities, then we're getting into and we need to recognize that actually that wealth. And we, we now have tools that we use to capture some of that wealth, a proportion of that wealth, and to be able to redistribute it to people in the city who don't necessarily have the capacities to, to capture that wealth and to, and to benefit from it. So I think there's a, there is potentially a whole area of work which I feel planners need to come much, much closer to and, and deal with it's a part of the uh, 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 transport oriented development repertoire of, 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 of tools. It's part of the transferable development rights repertoire of tools. There are many, many different tools now, uh, which places like the Lincoln Institute have, have, have really expanded on and developed. And um, I think there's something there that planners need to get a grip on if we're really going to address questions of, of inequality. Um, and I'm not undermining the political challenges of that. And as Jadeep says, the, the political challenges of these things, because we're challenging essentially power relations in the city, are, 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 can be formidable. But we do have the capacities to do that. And I would argue that fundamental to achieving that is precisely the methodologies that we are using in the NO program, which is to start the process with the co-production of knowledge. In other words, when you start the process and you set up the relationships with actors at multi-scalar levels, and together you agree on and, and you work through and you build capacities to create knowledge together in the city, at different scales and in different ways, I think that you have the potential there. Uh, keeping in mind the positionality, keeping in mind the ethics of doing research, all those things, but that fundamental uh, uh, platform of co-producing knowledge uh, completely changes the ball game. It completely changes the ball game, and it it will help to create and build this multi-level governance that is much, much fairer, much, much more inclusive. Anyway, that is, is our commitment in the NO program. And we've started to see that happening in the small, small interventions, and in some cases, not so small interventions that, that, that our team has been involved in. And in a way that I think directly links, and I'll hand over to Jaideep now, it directly links to the ethics of research and the, and the do no harm principle. Thanks, Karen. I'll jump straight in, Katrina, because I know we're we're already over time. 
Um, I uh, what, what I can do is I'll I'll stick in in the chat box in a minute uh, the link to our paper uh, that my rice colleagues and I have written on on safeguarding uh, in in global health research. Um, uh, so that will save me time from going through that. But but indeed, I think positionalities are are extremely important here, um, particularly given we are discussing. Uh, highly sensitive uh, public health uh, discourses that, uh, as we have seen, um, very rapidly evolve into sustained policy choices. So as researchers, we have to be very aware that, uh, you know, this moment, uh, as any, uh, our, our words are, uh, are extremely critical and we need to be um, ensure that there's uh, safeguarding at the heart of, of what we're doing. Um, just one, you know, you, you spoke of um, ungoverned spaces, Katrina. So let, let me just refer to that as well. Uh, and, and again, um, you know, we, both Karen and I have said this a lot. These aren't new ideas, uh, but certainly um, the pandemic has forced us to look at non-state actors in the ways that they have uh, engaged in the development process. Uh, or indeed the, gov the process of governance, uh, locally, regionally, transnationally. Um, and, and this brings uh, planning processes into new question um, about how, again, our curricula do or don't uh, incorporate non-state non actors, non-state processes uh, in the way we teach planning. And I think also just to link to that, I'd like to draw your attention to the work of the Bartlett Ethics Commission in the Bartlett itself around questions of safeguarding in research, but also within the NO program, we're developing um, something called Practicing Ethics, a Practicing Ethics platform in, in collaboration with the Bartlett Ethics Commission. And uh, I would, um, that will, that is not quite ready yet to go online, but it will shortly be going online. And it, it's a very sophisticated, I think, set of guidelines on, on to guide uh, research methodologies, very, to apply, to an applied situation like planning. Yeah, well, um, thanks a lot, everyone. I think you have opened up a, a lot of avenues of discussion that hopefully will be tapped into in the following events. And just to announce that our next uh, event will happen on November 17th, so pencil that down. We will have uh, as a guest uh, Raquel Rolnik, and the topic uh, of this new event will be housing justice and the ur urban planning during pandemic time. So we will, you know, uh, advertise more information soon, but just keep it in your diary so we can keep uh, discussing this. And in February, more, like, more likely, we are going to be discussing precisely uh, the ethical dilemmas. What are the new methodologies? What does it mean to research during pandemic? And what does it mean to research about the pandemic and its implications for planning practices? So I think that's going to be a very vibrant and interesting, um, uh, but the details will be sent and circulated soon. So thanks a lot, everyone. And thank you, Karen and Jaydeep. So big of applause uh, for our guests. So hopefully next time we are in a room <laughs> so we can actually hear the claps of the, of the audience. So thank you everyone for coming. And for some of you that were asking if this uh, recording will be available, it's gonna be on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. So be there and we're gonna be sharing it in all our social media. So thanks everyone for coming and hopefully we can meet you and see you soon in the following event. Thanks a lot, bye everyone. Thank you, bye-bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. See you.